Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I am delighted uh, to introduce you to Mary Poppin. Mary is President and Chief Customer Officer of HR Horizons Employee Experience Division. She's a professor of practice at Michigan State University teaching CXM, Customer Experience Management, MS, master's degree, the only one of its kind. She's an angel investor, a former success factors guru, and a current success factors guru, but uh, someone I worked with. And she's authored an amazingly relevant book for us, Goodbye Churn, Hello Growth. Mary, so good to see you again. Hi, Alex. Great to see you. Thanks for having me today. Well, it's a delight. So, Mary, I am honored and delighted to have you for several reasons. So, when I think of great customer experience from, you know, even pre-sales, you know, showing how how the 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 experience could be uh, of working with a company, you are leading those initiatives at Success Factors. You are leading the deployment initiatives. You are leading post-deployment initiatives. And you were doing it for a company that was delivering employee experience or like there was extra burden on creating an amazing experience. So I've seen you do all that and you're the the, cla- the MVP and the rock star of that universe. Then we, we haven't chatted for, for many years. And then, you know, on LinkedIn, I just see that you're, you know, joining companies, leading companies, getting like LinkedIn and Glint, and now you're running your own division in kind of an entrepreneurial way. So I just have so many potential areas where we could go today on what does it take to great create great customer experience, great employee experience, and you know where do you want to take it? Like what what what's what's top of your mind? You know for for the audience of relate to who wants to, they care at you know at this podcast on creating great experiences. Where do you think there's big gaps today in the experience world? And where can we start making a change? Wow, you're right. We could start so many places. You know, maybe it would be fun to start with the linkage between employee experience and customer experience. Because I do think it makes sense to people, but I think organizations are still not focusing on, in many cases, even both, you know, either one of those experiences. And companies who focus on both in parallel and see the synergies and the linkages have incredible results. You know, stock prices increase, uh, retention of customers and employees goes up. Like there's just so much goodness from having a focus on helping employees feel engaged and important and helping the customers feel like they're getting a lot of value and that, that they're an important part of the company as well. So this this is super fascinating. And you know, obviously the kind of the, for those that are relatively new to this, like, yeah, if I, my ex- employee is just upset and, you know, can't wait to, you know, shut down, you know, on the clock and doesn't really care that much about the mission and is, you know, maybe the type of human being that's, that is not very other oriented, like in terms of like enjoying helping people, you know, hey, that's, that's, it sounds like a very bad combination for customer growth and happiness. And I, I think obviously the, you know, when the when customers are are not doing well, they're kind of, they're, they're tougher to, it's tough for employees. It's, you know, it's tough, it's tough all, all around for the business. But w- if, if you had to put the cart and the horse together, which, you know, like we know we want them both. <laughs> Where do you think is the start? And does it really differ by business in your view? So my perspective is if you can start with both in parallel and you get the right people in a room to talk about it. So you need to have, you know, HR in the room and you need to have customer, you know, the customer leader in the room to talk about what is the experience of the employees who are delivering on the customer experience. And by the way, that's customer facing and non-customer facing roles too. So the product team that is completely out of touch and not engaged to understand their customers are building things that aren't going to ultimately bring value. Right. And that's not good for the business or because, because they're creators. I'm a creator. I create, right. Like there's a, that's, and it's a, it's there's a culture of that, right. Like we celebrate creators, right. Like we don't necessarily separate, celebrate creators that connect to the audience 
or like the you know quite right. the same way you know yeah but then when these creators go wait a second i just created this amazing functionality but no one's adopting it it must be cs's fault they're not rolling it out or enabling customers on it or they're not you know customer don't get it you know or what what have you but if they understand the business context around what they're building and how customers are going to use it and the use case and it's built the product is built based on that the employee you know the customer facing team the delivery team understands how to help the customer roll it out in their organization and then there's measures in place so the customer actually sees the impact and the value like this is the beautiful sort of thread, right? From the product design and the being able to roll it out and then customers actually adopting it and getting value. And if you can circle, you know, circle it back and share that with product and share those stories, all of a sudden there's this shared, you know, vision and shared mm -hmm. fault that it isn't just, I'm going to build this, you're going to implement it and walk away and the customer will use it or don't. It, it gets everybody into their role in the story, right? And so it's an ongoing journey rather than, you know, a one and done implementation, if you will. Yeah, and I think there's a shortcut mem that we are using, and I'm sure you've, you, we, I haven't invented it. I've st stolen from somebody like you at some point, which is that everybody's in uh, customer success and everybody's in sales. And mm -hmm. like, and, and I think there's product need like the, the product team and the R and D team needs to be thinking about those components. Right. Mm -hmm. But what we've added also is for, for like, it's, you know, we're running a more kind of innovative company that, you know, we don't have as many, you know, but about barriers, but even there still, we need to remind, um, uh, ourselves that you know the job is not to answer a customer question the job is to you know get them to success and you know make sure that whatever we interpret that question we dig what's underneath that so we could cycle that back to the product and say and design and say hey we're getting a lot of questions. We thought this was pretty, I thought it was obvious. I thought it was a great idea, but you know, seems like I could have stepped on my own toe here. You know, is this, so how do you kind of create that culture of humility where there's a lot of smart, let's say motivated people, right? We don't have a problem where people are demotivated, right? But like, there's just a lot of moving pieces and you have to remember the product and, you know, respond to the question quickly and then respond strategically. And, you know, there are a lot of those questions coming in, right? Like how, what have you seen the most successful organizations do to create that 360? So it's really easy to get into a cycle of being reactive, right? And if, if departments don't, communicate or interact or share information and share insights, then it just perpetuates that sort of reactive culture and mindset that my job is X. You know, have you ever heard, that's not my job. That's not my job, yeah. <laughs> well, it may not be your job, but you know what? Somebody presented an issue to you. You have a responsibility to your colleagues, the customer and the company to figure yeah. out then who you need to kind of do a warm handoff to, right? So it's, I think it's just building the mindset around what is our mission? What are we trying to accomplish? And what does that mean to our customers? And then how do we help our customers get there? And then what is your role in it? So it's mm. painting the picture around that shared vision and helping people understand how they contribute, but how others contribute too. That's where they see where they can work together, where they can make improvements. But I think the bigger part of it is they understand that at the end of the day, they're part of the impact of the customer. Yeah, yeah. It isn't just, we have a customer success organization. So by the way, it's your job to just deliver customer value. You have to figure it out. And oh, we had customers leave. It's your fault. No, we didn't have a solution that the customers could tie to value. So that was the problem, right? But if you can build that shared mindset around ownership, 
and accountability and ha- help people understand how they need to, you know, work with others in the organization to deliver the outcome. It becomes a, you know, help me help you mindset instead right. of I this is my role and this is what I deliver. So roles are convenient but problematic in the organizations that want to move fast, right? Because they just create these artificial barriers and and you know, but but what about large organizations? Right? Like so we and I would say even if a small organization, we need to be deliberate about reminding what's going on, right? Right now, I you know, when I was in large organizations it was tough. In our small organizations, we look cute. So when we have a Zoom meeting, like all hands Zoom meeting, we have a persona that shows up and their their name in the Zoom is relate to customer in search of wow. And there's actually a person underneath this. Her name is KD. She's awesome. She kind of reacts to when something does, somebody does something really cool from a customer perspective, like to remind everybody in this sort of crazy distributed world that we live in that you know there's a real human being underneath that like there's you know or in our case many amazing beings they kind of they're they've got a lot going on and you know there's a joy in helping somebody and there's like that just makes life meaningful right and you want to help your colleagues and you that's also like you said we help 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 you but there's this sort of joy in in having this purpose. And then what we do as well in, in those meetings, we regularly go and really tell what those customers are doing with our platform. So there's the stakes, right? Like this customer is solving diabetes too. Do you have a grandma that wants to get access to, to this pretty soon? We're right? like, we're helping them get this drug out, you know, faster or better or in this market or whatever is the things, right? Like, and there could be many others. And that humanizes it, right? Like it becomes, oh, we're, you know, it's not a software thing. It's like we're helping organizations that do important things, tackle important things. So we're small, we're doing this, but I don't, I, I wonder, you know, you must have come up with, you know, the, you know, gazillions of examples of best practices. What do you want to share with our audience that kind of, is, you, they could go and take away immediately in building this customer centricity across, you know, marketing, sales, all functions. So, so often the challenge comes from teams not having the right processes or the right systems to support the kind of delivery that's desired, right? So the ideal customer journey can only be reached if people have the resources and tools and are incentivized, right, to take the right actions. And so a lot of it, unfortunately, employees are waiting for their leadership to provide that kind of vision and the processes and the tools. For example, how sales should do a handoff to customer success and what customer success needs to do in that process to then go into a customer with an understanding that's already been built right, of the customer for months in many cases. Worst Mm. thing you can do, in my opinion, is walk into a customer and go, okay, you know, I'm your CSM. What do you want to do? It's like, we spent six Ah! months. Three months. Three months (laughs) we've been talking about it. (laughs) I know. But, but But the problem is a lot of times leadership hasn't taken, you know, steps to define that process and the systems and the handoff and enable their team and then incentivize that behavior. But if you're an employee in a company like that, you know, fear not, there's things you can do. You can start to, you know, role model a better process. You know, you reach out, I could reach out to you, Alex, and say, hey, can we do a quick 30 minute handoff on this customer, right? You can start to document and share with your manager, hey, I just did this with from a sales transition perspective. Here's how it went, right? And so mm-hmm. there is this sort of, you know, grassroots opportunity for people to raise their hand and either be vocal about what's not working or even start to take action themselves that ultimately sort of spirals. I think all too often employees feel like they don't they don't have the power or they're going to overstep by trying to take those actions. When in reality, 
it's going to help make the organization better, you know? So I, my, anybody listening, that's an, an employee that's feeling kind of stifled, right? Like they don't have what they need to actually deliver a good customer experience, start to raise the challenges, let people know, be vocal, and maybe just start just to do just, it. Just, just well, start. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just do it. <laughs> hey, all relate to folks listening to this. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> just do it. <laughs> I, I think this is exactly right because I, I think there is a little bit of maybe status imbalance, you know, in some cases, right? Like, or, you know, like, let's say cultural uh, differences, right? Like, so let we, we have folks that are, some are in Philippines, some are in Latvia, some are in Brazil, you know, different cultures have different incentives for, you know, you know, leading on something and, you know, maybe, you know, taking a follower role. And I feel like a lot of customer success and, you know, customer interorganizations could actually be sometimes in the, not in the same cultural mind frame as the sales organization, right? Or, you know, like could be like, not, like not only different function, but a different geography, right? And, you know, yes, there's a major culture for the organizations, but every team has its own mini cultures that develop a little bit based on leaders and so on. So, I a lot of what I find I'm doing is I'm like, hey, you're the CEO of this. Don't look at me. You're the CEO of this project. You're the CEO of this. And people like it, but it's it's like it needs a reminder, right? Like there is a, hey, if this is a safe decision. Like you can't go wrong. You don't need to check in. You can, you know, go like, you know, what fundamental principles are here. What are you finding that kind of gives people confidence? I, that especially well, don't come from those cultures, right? Like where it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. grab the bull by the horn and whatever happens, happens, right? Like to go and be that, be the bulldozer that makes customers successful if that's necessary, right? And push yeah, on I, somebody as accountability if they're not responsive, right? I think there are, there's a few things. Transparency in terms of what's happening in the company and sharing with everybody kind of the overall status and what are the priorities to make improvements is one thing. And then communicating, you know, that if you, if you have ideas, bring them forward, you know, communicating that it's a safe environment is a really important thing. A lot of times we think, well, it's just, it's just part of our culture. People just know they could speak up. But that's not true. You have to sometimes be very direct about it to give employees that comfort that, okay, they said they would listen and they have an open door policy. So they trust that. But the first time that it backfires, right? Yeah. Then it's going to take forever to like dig out of. So it's really important to follow through and for leadership to be transparent and, you know, over communicate and give that sense of you're in it with us. We're all in it together. So your voice matters. And do you remember the really the success factor? This just reminds me. So our CEO, Lars, had asked everybody, how do we become more efficient? How do we reduce costs? And people started, like, say, don't have coffee cups, <laughs> you know, in the uh, paper coffee cups. Everybody should have their own coffee mug, right, to reduce costs. And everybody should use the same. Here's one. Well. I still have one, yeah, I still have one right here. <laughs> And and it it allowed people to have a voice, but it also created a lot of great ideas that yeah. people that we could execute on as a company, right? So I mean, just there's things like that that I've seen work really successful. The other thing I would say is if you have customer satisfaction surveys and employee engagement surveys, those are great opportunities to understand and dig in where are the gaps, what's going on, right? And to get a pulse. And if you can combine the insights from both of those, mm. you now hear what is your customer saying is missing or they need or what's working well, even better, versus what are your employees saying they need to help the customer be successful or what's missing. And now if you can link those together and start to prioritize action based on that, you start to see improvement. But even better, communicate to the employees and the customers that you heard them and that you're taking action on it, what the action is, and then communicate progress, right? That's how people feel like they're being brought along in the journey and they feel invested 
So it lets employees feel engaged. Customers feel like, why would they leave, right? They're being listened to and they have a strong partnership. Yeah, it's 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 this this notion of feeling heard, right? Like this is just a fundamental human need. Right? <laughs> yeah. I would argue some genders are worse at it than at, at making others feel heard than others, so, you know. <laughs> but I think it's it's it it varies, right? Like but I think I I've personally had to work and continue to work harder at it where I mess it up, right? Like and it's sort of, oh, I need to remind myself this is a conversation where I'm a listener, not a problem solver or even motivator and rah, rah, like, and that's, you know, just, you know, we, we, it's hard to context switch when you're kind of in, in execution decisive mode and yeah. uh, remember to kind of, Oh, okay. I need, this is where I need to exercise the listening arm because this is an important, you know, point of connecting. So how do you advise that you know if we drill into this right you you're you're doing a lot of employee engagement kind of surveys you know how do you advise the balance between heard and you know executed on and sometimes even like you know you get a lot of ideas some of them are not as good as like let's stop using cups some of them are like totally off and even like off the message, off the right. vision, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe everybody just heard that idea because that is absolutely not where we're going. And it's like, you know, so there are these moments, right? Like where you kind of want to point intelligently. Mm-hmm. And and then there are moments where where you need to listen. So guide me a little bit how to think of that. So I think part of it is acknowledging that, right, that the person has uh, an opinion and a voice and thanking them for expressing it. And then being able to share, again, I'll come back to communication transparency, being able to share where we're going and why that suggestion at this point in time isn't necessarily going to fit right with the priorities but that will be kind of taken into advisement, you know, as things progress, things like that. So it kind of comes back to the messaging of feeling heard, feeling that people are grateful that I'm at least sharing my thoughts, but being transparent about it it, it aligns or doesn't align, right, with the vision and this is why. And so, you know, as a leader, and I also think the fact that you realize, you know, what is it, uh, recognition is like the first step, (laughs) awareness. So yeah. is the first step to right to to fixing something is that you can be real and genuine with your team saying, I know there's times I probably am not gonna, you know, give feedback on your idea, or I might be off already exploring something else before you're done sharing your idea with me. So I just ask you to raise your hand and let me know, right? That you have more to say, or you're not done with your idea, things like that. So if you kind of invite people to let you know when you're doing what you know you do, Mm. that's, that's that safety of being able, right, to have that open dialogue and give, give them, put the power back on in them, right, empower them to be able to speak up. Yeah, and, and I think kind of want to build on that because a lot of things that come up with customers, right? Sometimes it's communication, sometimes it's like maybe junior team members, like maybe it's a new product, you're learning things. A lot of it is we make mistakes. <laughs> and so one of the things that I like to say to my team is like, I'm opinionated, but I make the most mistakes of everyone. So, and, you know, and, and so I kind of create this, try to create an environment where it's safe to not just have ideas and, and things, but also it's safe to say, hey, you know what? We tried it this way. It, you know, we missed this or we had the best intentions. It didn't work out. Well, let's debrief and build a culture of safety around acknowledging that and you know, not getting into the blaming thing, which mm-hmm. you know is very naturally, you know, r- you know, just human reaction. And I have to. I don't know if I always do that. My team will have give me 360, but I I became better at okay, why is this wrong? 
which makes somebody, de- why is this not working, which makes somebody defensive to, okay, what can we, you know, seems like this is really useful. What can we do to learn from this type of context? It's just a small change, right? Mm-hmm. But I think it enables this culture that we're all in this together to, you know, debug the customer experience, debug the employee experience, debug the product, right? Which is where the, the bug debuggering is, is considered like debug the sales journey of a buyer who we want to make them feel comfortable. What are you seeing on that, on this particular topic, right? Having worked in, you know, very innovative organizations that move fast, you know, the openness to making mistakes. Well, I think you hit it right on the head, um, which is building a learning culture. So giving people guardrails, but room to explore. And by the way, the word, like the term intelligent risks, I was going to say, you hear that a lot. As part of our culture, we take intelligent risks. But if you don't define what intelligent risk means, people, employees still don't understand it. So you kind of have to define, like, it's not okay, Alex, that that you negotiate a whole new legal contract on your own <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that puts us that that's a big risk. So that's that's an area that's that not an intelligent have. risk. That's a <laughs> that's a risk risk. <laughs> right. But if if a customer asks for, yeah. you know, an extra half hour of your time, right? And you've got time in the day, even though you might go over, you know, be overutilized or whatever from a services perspective, like it's okay to say yes. You know, and let's come back and figure out why did they need more time? Why did we estimate the hours wrong, right? So giving them the freedom to do kind of what's right for the customer, again, within bounds, but letting them explore. And then when it, you know, when there aren't like optimal business results, looking at it to say, what can we learn from it? What can we do different, right? So it gives people some freedom in their role to explore and make decisions and hopefully find even better ways to do things, right? But it's that learning mindset. It's okay to do things differently than just, you know, follow this template. If you have a better idea, let's explore it, you know? Um, And if you happen to go outside of this process and it doesn't work, let's regroup and debrief and learn from it and just not do it again, right? So it's that feeling like they're not gonna get in trouble, Mm. but we're gonna look at it as a learning opportunity. So one of the kind of the, you brought up examples, spend the extra 30 minutes with a customer, right? Which is great example. And we also talked earlier about reactive versus proactive. So one of the challenges that I think many organizations feel about experiences is that they have different types of customers. And sometimes they're small or that's a new unit and you don't have like, hey, we're focused on these types of businesses and we're focused on these very large accounts. You're just, it's it's one, one team trying to b- balance, you know, a broad portfolio of, you know, customers and products and so on. And the individuals need to make resource allocation decisions, mm-hmm. right? And if I am a people pleaser, a customer pleaser, a pleaser, right? Which I think, believe it or not, I realized in some areas, I am a pleaser. You probably would never have guessed that. But like, I I think there's a lot more nicer people, you know, that I work with than me. But like, if I, if I'm sometimes like trying to not, you know, like, you know, be thoughtful of other people, oh my God, you know, other like some amazing people that like are just heart of gold, that want to keep everybody, you know, happy. But by keeping everybody happy, we introduce a risk Mm -hmm. to the business, right? Because, you know, sad story is that not every customer is always, you know, the same potential in terms of the revenue for the business or the impact of something going wrong with your flagship customer is much higher risk. The impact of Things going badly right before renewal are much, you know, higher than any, the other times. The, you know, the, and there's all these trade-offs, right? And, and, but at the same time, you also want to build a culture where you are able to support the 
the small but very important customers that maybe are not the biggest revenue carriers, but you want to have some kind of a scalable approach. So I kind of always get torn, right? Like, because on the one hand, you know, I want us to, to, to make every customer feel special, Mm -hmm. but, but that's a, you know, so, so, and we can use content in our case, like it relate to, you know, relate to world in success factors. We had a content, you know, content solutions. We could build in resources that provide a kind of a scalable, low touch, you know, or automated support capabilities, but it's hard, right? Like, you know, to, to always balance it out. And so I'm like always going in like, great that you supported this small customer, but, you know, for the small customers that have similar problems, maybe we need to have a repeatable resource, right? Versus for the major customer or major employee campaign, that's very different. Maybe we need something that's really bespoke and helping people Think about it like that. You must have dealt this with, you know, 10,000 times more complexity than I have. So guide us a little bit. What have you learned from all those trade-offs? And, you know, how do you help people think through that trade-off? You know, it's such a, it's, it's, I've seen it over and over again with startups who grow and become, you know, fast growing companies. And then even within public companies, different business units even have kind of similar challenges because you get to a point when you start, you are all hands on deck. It's a high touch experience because you have to find out what's your ICP. How do they, you know, use the software and what are the best use cases, right? And then even by industry and you start to think about all these things, but until you have enough customers to really understand that process and what it should look like, What does success look like? It's sort of all hands on deck. Then, of course, you grow to a point that it isn't scalable to do that, but Mm -hmm. it's hard to let go of that model because that's all you know as a company and that's the culture, right? Right. And so so then you have to start introducing segmentation and looking at customers of this size. What does success look like for them? What have we done for them that's successful? And now we can look at what can we automate, you know, what would give them the same value and make them feel important, but less touch. And then you can infuse parts along the journey where they do still get right that personalized feeling. But it really kind of starts with having to look at the journey. What does success look like? Find out, you know, what you can automate and then start to move, you know, to that segmentation and to those models The important part about the migration with employees is to let them know that we're doing this to help customers get value faster, put more in the hands of the customer, but allow the employees to touch more customers from a success perspective, you know, in a strategic perspective, instead of answering the same challenges over and over and over, right? And so it helps the employees feel more engaged. They're touching more customers, bringing more value. Then the higher touch customers, they can take advantage of the self serve the digital model mm-hmm. when when they want to, but they mm-hmm. have the opportunity, they have the hand holding because they're willing to pay for it too, right? right? Mm-hmm. And they're from a revenue perspective, you kind of can't, you have to put more eyes on it. So it's a natural kind of progression you know, around, you know, say 20. 30 million in revenue where you start and depending on your business and stuff, but where you start to see customer segmentation needed to help the team scale. Cause you can't hire a CSM for every customer yeah. you bring on, right? Yeah. At some point. Yeah. And so the model ultimately becomes defining what does success look like? What does the journey look like? And how do we scale it? And then that's what you can apply for your smaller customers because they will feel like it's personalized. At the end of the day, they're going to get great outcomes. You've just mm-hmm. taken, you know, the people out of certain steps. Out of the equation in some some areas yeah. that are not as value added. And, and I think that leads us to, you know, one of, you know, I'd love to get your comment on one of the quotes that we picked up from you. You said in one of your interviews, and once you get a customer, you should focus on keeping them for life. 
I think it's taking out of context, obviously, you know, without a question, you know, it's much easier to keep a customer sometimes than to acquire a new one. Mm -hmm. But what are, do you think this is like, you know, having grown with companies for so many years, right? Mm -hmm. Like, what's your take on, you know, customers, they're just hard, you know, they're just hard to work with, right? You have limited resources. And we're starting to see even be like in the pilots, we're going, well, well, I'm not sure. Like, I want to work that hard to get you on board as a customer. You're not organized. You're not respectful. You're asking for discounts before talking about any any value. You know, like, you're like I'm not here working at a bazaar. We're building something, like, valuable, right? So for me, and maybe I'm, like, a little bit going to put too much value in what we're building, right, and how important it is, but we do think we're unique. And so I, I'm not, I'm struggling a little bit with mm -hmm. this sort of selection because there's a part of me that is, hey, customer obsessed, customer centric. But then there is, there must be a realization that not every customer is right for every business, every product. How do you help you know organizations think that through? So it is true. There are some companies that aren't a good fit you know, for certain solutions, either because of the, you know, the maturity of the solution itself, or just the overall intent of the outcomes. And unfortunately, during the sales process, those things aren't aligned. So again, coming back to the learning, hopefully for those customers, you have very few of them because you learn quickly, you know, which ones aren't a good fit. But I think that the reality is, if you don't think about your customer's like the relationship with your customers as an evolution, right? Meet them where they are and think about how do you continue to move them along in maturity and sort of evolve not only the relationship, but the value you're bringing. And so a lot of customers, I mean, just thinking about you know, talent management <laughs> as, a, as an option, there are still companies out there that do you know talent management in Word docs, you know, and things. And, and so it's, it's meeting the customer at the very beginning if they're really immature and saying, here's how we can help you and here's how we'll grow together. And then in those quarterly value review meetings, it's looking at that. Where did you start? What's the progress we've made and where are we going? Now, the challenging customers are the ones, and this is fun and this is good, but they're the ones that are pushing the boundaries of what you've built. They're mature, mm. they're forward thinking, and they're ready. They need your solution today, but they're using it at kind of maximum complexity. Mm. So the challenge there is how do you keep progressing those customers, right? And at the end of the day, there might be, let's just say 5% of your customer base, or let's just say 3% that are at the top of that maturity level. Do you want to invest there right now or don't right. you? Right. You do run the risk of them if there is another solution in the market leaving. But, right, if you invest now, doesn't mean you'll get more customers longer as well. So you got to kind of, you know, balance it. But that was a really long answer to say <laughs> there's a maturity curve. The maturity curve is, the, this out. is very interesting, right? Because that was missing in my, in my statement, but it was kind of implied. And I think that's a great way of thinking about it. So there's basically these two, there's like the average customer and that's probably the, in some ways good, right? Cause it's less mm -hmm. friction. And then you do want some of those challenging flagship customers because they'll make you better, especially if their vision aligns with yours. But what you right. don't want is those challenging customers if their vision does not align with your right. vision, right? Like that's a right. distraction. And and then there is the less mature ones. And that's, you know, maybe you need to provide educational resources. Maybe they're not a customer fit, right? right. And you just you need to be able to say no, I think. that's And I think it's it sort of is a, a real interesting question. You know, do you, does, does, who says no? Is it because I don't think an average sales organization says no? So it, it, does it come from 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 you know customer success, professional services organizations to say, hey, this is this is not going to end well? Well, all the most common story is that it ends the end of the contract. Maybe they get out a little bit sooner, first year right? Where 
you haven't been able to get them off the ground. They're not really getting value. They're not using it, in which case, right, they churn. And that's the opportunity for the learning. But hopefully you can identify where were the disconnects? What did we not establish as alignment from the very beginning? Then you get better at putting those things in place in the sales process. I think it's hard early on because you think you can meet their needs, right? Mm-hmm. And if, 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 if all of their business cases and use cases aren't discussed or all of their sort of outcomes aren't that defined, that's where you get into trouble. And so if you get better about asking those questions up front and say, yes, our solution matches that outcome, if they want something completely, you know, out of the realm, you can walk away earlier saying, well, we can do these three things, but we can't do these four things, you know? So I think, especially for a startup, it's really hard to figure that out before running into some of those challenges. Got it. Mary, as we're kind of wrap, wrapping up our discussion, you know, there's so many things that are still kind of left out there. But so for me, like three key questions are, you know, you, you over your career, right? You've looked at, you know, customer experience, you've looked at employee experience, you're you know, leading your own organizations where you can influence both. What have you seen change the most, you know, in at least software driven businesses that we've been a part of, mm-hmm. but you've supported all sorts of organizations. So I'd be curious, you know, what's your take? I think the technology and, and the appetite for data and using that data to have insights and start to make um, data-driven decisions has been probably the biggest ev- you know, evolution that I've seen, whether it's in customer experience or employee experience, or other experience, user experience, because AI has really been game changing and starting to look at relationships and patterns in data with new technologies behind the scenes and start to raise the most relevant insights and information. What's cool is you're starting to see relationships and things you may not ever have known existed, right? And you can do that within functional tools, you know, like a CRM or like a, a support, you know, software. But what's really cool is now people are starting to recognize the opportunity to go beyond that and start to look at the linkage of the insights and data across those systems, which allows the opportunity then for, you know, linkage of EX and CX and right, all, right. all of the stakeholder experiences to kind of come together in a total experience. So I'm excited about that. Maybe I'm a little bit, maybe I'm a little biased that we've gotten further than we have, but I see the appetite and companies building up those capabilities, which I think is really exciting. This is really helpful. Second of the of the last series of questions, we've talked a little bit about the power of the repeatable, scalable answers, right? That are maybe visual and kind of have a human touch to them, but are, you know, I want to many. So that's content. You know, how do you see the role of content evolve over time, right? Like where, you know, we started, we used to start with some sort of PDF handbooks, you know, some organizations (laughs) still use them, maybe the same ones that are using Word docs for talent (laughs) management, right? Some people fax stuff still, I'll fax you the instructions, right? (laughs) <laughs> and then, you know, we, a lot of our listeners, a lot of our customers tend to be kind of innovative on this. And they're saying, well, I could use great content to support, you know, customers on their own, employers on their own, or it could be a resource. I'm a new employee. I'm a new team member. I don't know everything, right? The products are complex. Customer needs are complex. You know, partner needs are complex. Is there a way for me to navigate through that efficiently? You know, that's what we're seeing. Is that what you're seeing? You're seeing a movement towards more, you know, more better content documentation. Yes. And I, I refer to, I, I, I like to refer to it as personalization at scale. So okay. there's now opportunities because remember it used to be marketing has always been trying to do this, which is get the right message to the right stakeholder. But what happens is the sort of this generic message goes out 
to all of your contacts at a customer, right? Or to the same prospects in different industries. And so the personalization aspect has been really hard. Also from a customer experience, like here's your, you know, implementation experience. It's exactly the same for every customer. When actually, again, going back to maturity, some might need different things at different times. Right. And then on the employee experience side, you know, when you come into a sales role versus a customer success role versus an HR role, you have different type of enablement that you need to do. Some so some is shared, right? A culture, et cetera, but some is very role specific. So content, I'm coming, I'm coming back to this. From a content perspective, we now have the opportunity to start to surface content by role, by level, by customer, by, right? And you can really start to personalize experiences with content. That is an incredible game-changing place to be from where we were with PDFs. But even the last couple of years, it's still been a blanket approach to content. And I see AI, you know, Relato, opportunities to, to really personalize the experience. So, so, so help you back to kind of that marketing dream that never happened because we're still getting, you know, right. an admin is getting the same email as the CEO, yeah. right? Like, in the, <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we, now we can at least could offer a support follow up that's relevant on various dimensions, maturity, product, etc. Great. Yeah. And speaking of content, you wrote a book. You know, obviously, in the topic near and dear to us. What was your biggest takeaway? What was the surprise? for you in, in writing, you know, or is it just a consolidation of what you've already seen? Or was there something new that you want to share with, with our audience? It was kind of a, a culmination of putting, you know, pen to paper, or fingers to keyboard around kind of crystallizing my thoughts about what works with customer experience, employee experience. What are the things that I saw that you know, overlap, what worked, what didn't work, and an opportunity to kind of put that all together to help other companies understand some of the pitfalls or implications of certain, you know, decisions or processes, and to help them sidestep, you know, those minds and accelerate their results. So I, I think the biggest aha, someone suggested to me that I write it with kind of a fictional, you know, character throughout and I hadn't thought about that. And so I started that journey and it was really helpful for me to sort of organize my thoughts around Hannah, who's in the boardroom, you know, delivering a message about you know, business results and how the company is, you know, seeing a decline, but how customer intelligence can save the day. And so using that as sort of my framework, I was able to, I think, put the content together in a more consumable way. If that makes so you sense. were customer centric in writing a, a <laughs> book about customer centricity. I think this is a way to go. I love it. Last question: You have now students, a, a very unique program, and so what is the number one? Like, if you have your last lecture, kind of parting thoughts for your students. Let's imagine we're all sitting in the classroom, virtual. In our case, it was you. What would be, you know, the one nugget that you would leave us with on creating, you know, world-class customer experience management experiences? <laughs> Starting somewhere is really important. It doesn't have to be 100%, you know, ready um, in order to roll out results and new initiatives. You, you, you know, get 80% there and then roll it out. Too often people sort of get in the analysis paralysis instead of taking action. So taking any action, making a step forward um, is better than trying to come up with the perfect plan. It's never going to be perfect. It's always going to be changing. So take one action as soon as possible. Well, I'm going to flatter myself when I celebrate myself for taking the action to reconnect with you, Mary, because <laughs> this was phenomenal. I have notes to take and share. This was my team. Uh, it was just a wealth of knowledge on all the things that we care about. But I think more importantly, every great organization needs to care about. If they really care about their customers, they need to really care about their employees. And that needs to permeate throughout uh, so Mary, thank you so much for sharing your insights. How can people find you? 
buy your book, you know, tell us how we can follow up on all this knowledge. You can find me on LinkedIn under Mary Poppin. So please connect with me. And my book is on Amazon. Goodbye, churn. Hello, growth. And I appreciate you reaching out, Alex. It's so good to see you. We're going to have to catch up more often than, you know, every like five to 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, so great to have you, Mary. And we're definitely going to be thinking, I think it would be worth for us to get together and think through how you can permeate with your your philosophy, your insights into, I think, content that is human, right? And not like, you know, maybe empowered by AI a little bit, but actually, you know, reaches the way we people process information and solve problems and create connections. So I was really fortunate and will continue to try to download everything from your brain into, <laughs> into scalable content-based technology for customer experience and employee experience. So thank you so much. You will be named in our product. <laughs> There's going to be a Mary Poppin module. I think that's, <laughs> that's, that's the feedback. So, you know, you're part of the journey. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you.